lives can impact maternal health in disaster and conflict situations. I myself um, am a midwife of over two decades experience who is currently working as a consultant in the humanitarian context. Claire Reading is our presenter today who I actually have had the to Bangladesh last year so it was quite amazing to see that she was then also matched with me with this. So we have kept in touch since, and I know that you will enjoy her presentation, which is timely. The estimates that are currently given that there are 877 women who die daily of presentable causes of maternal newborn health, and that of the 807 that die, that over 500 die in countries that are fragile because of natural conflicts or disaster. So this, again, gives us the scope of the problem. Claire, we turn it over Hi, to you. Hi, good morning, everybody. Yourself. Can you hear me? Pandora, can you hear me? OK, fine. I was, uh, I was uh, obsessed that maybe I would start and then uh, people be waving their hands saying they can't hear me. Tanya, you can hear me. This is great. Hi, everybody. Um, so this is my presentation. Um, it's mainly based around um, the work I've done in South Sudan. I came back last week from a short uh, two-month stint there, um, and previously I was there last year as well. Um, I work for Medicines Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, um, and I've given this presentation before, so that's why their logo is, um, is over it as well. Okay, let's uh, make a start. And it works. Isn't it lovely when the technology works? Um, OK, so basically the objectives of the presentation, I wanted to highlight the neglected area of sexual and reproductive health because I feel that it's often the thing that people add in at the end. Um, it's, oh, yeah, there's a malnutrition crisis or there's been a hurricane and now we have cholera. And the team goes in and you have your doctors, you have your nurses, you have your water engineers, you have your psychologists. And it feels that the midwife can sometimes be the person that is added at the end because people then realize that, you know what, actually all these disasters, natural and man-made, they all need somebody being the advocate and speaking up for the women and the, and the babies. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the health challenges faced by women who are caught up in conflict, um, be that current conflict or post-conflict zones. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about the challenges faced by midwives that I've worked with and when we have time out from work and we talk about their lives and it's very hard to find, a, to, to really understand. I can nod and I can, you know, say that's really going on in your life, but I can't really understand it. And I think then trying to relate that to a work context um, makes you really understand the real challenges faced by by staff working in um, in low and middle income countries where there is a uh, conflict. So I'm going to be sharing with you um, my experiences of working in the Democratic Republic of Congo. I was there with MSF in 2015 and in South Sudan, like I said, last year and this year. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about what MSF is doing for internally displaced people um, and refugees and what our focus is on, um, which is very similar to many of the big international um, NGOs. And going forward, so how do we go forward and what are the solutions? I, I'm not going to give you solutions if I had them, um, I'd be out there implementing them now, but it's very challenging. And um, I've got, got some of my personal, maybe they're more opinions rather than uh, <laughs> than statistically backed up ideas. OK. Um, I know you can't click that link, um, and we're not going to do it. That is a short film. It's around five minutes. Um, and that's of Malakal POC. And a POC is a protection of civilians run by the United Nations. Um, and that's in Malakal in the north. East, and that's where I was based um, in March and April. Um, we have a hospital there, but we don't provide maternity services. But you get the idea of, of the quality of life that people are living. 
and I'd urge you all um, to to watch that film because it gives you a big perspective on what's going on. And lots of people will say to me, oh, how was Sudan? And I have to keep saying, I wasn't in Sudan. I was in South Sudan. It's quite a different context, okay? Um, so I put a little map because the people of South Sudan obviously are very proud that they are the youngest country in the world, um, even though their country is being ravaged at the moment. And I know most of you probably know this, but maybe some people don't, um, because some of my colleagues didn't know this. Um, so it's about what you can expect uh, from MSF or from uh, many of the NGOs who provide maternity care um, in middle and low income countries, because actually it's quite different um, to that of the UK. So we encourage the women to come as early as possible, obviously, and we would still give folic acid um, if they come uh, before 12 weeks. And uh, trying to encourage women to come for a minimum of four antenatal clinic contacts, all right? Um, you might think, my goodness, that's hardly anything. But actually, if women live very far away um, from a health facility, and remember that it, there isn't really a Ministry of Health in South Sudan, there is in the Democratic Republic of Congo, but it's very, um, it's not consistent. So sometimes drugs come, uh, occasionally people get paid. It's not, uh, you know, um, it's not stable, basically. And there isn't um, a, like I said, a Ministry of Health, okay? So most of the funding uh, coming in for health is coming from uh, the World Bank as well as international NGOs. Um, we're very hot on giving vaccinations and obviously we want to protect the women against tetanus um, and they have a little card and so people, are, women are very good at this actually in my opinion um, but uh, still meeting a lot of women who are having baby number four, baby number five who have never accessed antenatal care um, and due to displacement are then uh, seeing the MSF is there and coming to, to the clinic. Um, we screen and treat and give management for malaria, anemia, STIs, so mainly syphilis, and then we'll do flow charts um, uh, for other STIs if women have got um, uh, symptoms. And equally, we'll give them something called albendazole in the second and trimester as a one-off to treat um, for parasitic um, infections. Um, the, the last one is quite a, a challenging one, uh, giving a sterile delivery kit. And that sterile delivery kit um, is, is great. So it has sterile gloves. It has two small um, towels, so one to, to dry the baby and one to keep the baby warm. It has a sterile blade and it has two pieces of sterile um, cord to dry, to, to tie the cord, sorry. So it's perfect. But um, I had an I had kind of an internal emotional turmoil about it because if I give this kit, am I kind of saying to the ladies, it's okay, you don't need to come back here for delivery. You just have this kit and, and call your TBA and, and have your baby at home. Um, and it's very difficult because some women who live, you know, 40, 50 kilometers away or if they go into labor in the dark, actually it's not safe for them to come to, to the clinic, to the hospital, to have their baby with us. Um, so I find this one a really, a really difficult one. So we used to, the team and I used to say, here's the kit, but actually, can you bring the kit back to, with us when you come in for labour? Only you have the baby at home if you're really, if that's what you want. But we would encourage you all to come here with us uh, and bring your TBA as well. So we, we're all doing, we're, we're all here to support you together. And I think that is, it's a very much a collaborative, you know, that partnership as well. Okay, so um, the health challenges um, for, for midwives, and what are they? So I think I, I touched on it briefly then, the security um, for midwives and women working in maternity. So, you know, we provide a 24-7 service, and I definitely felt that staff didn't want to travel in at night as soon as it got dark. 
So we had some staff in South Sudan who would sleep in the compound because they felt that they were safer there. Um, we've had staff in um, DRC when they were on call to be the first attendant at a C-section. The, they physically couldn't get there because they, they said, it's just not safe for me to come. It's dark. It's the night. I don't feel safe. So, you know, not only is it not always safe for women to go out and get firewood um, and leave compounds or leave the POC. So that's like a, a camp for internally displaced people, so the protection of civilian camp. So not only is it safe, not safe for women to leave, it's not safe for health workers either. So just because you have an ID badge doesn't mean obviously it's safe for them either. So there's a definite issue that of, of looking after our staff, so also giving them somewhere to live, which obviously isn't always the easiest thing either. Um, working in a place like DRC or South Sudan after years and years, decades of, of war has meant that we have a massive um, depleted pool of midwives and skilled birth attendants, um, not only to care for them, but to identify complications. And that for me is the big thing, identifying when we need to refer this woman to a higher level um, um, comprehensive unit. Um, this is a really big issue. And I know lots of people are working on this, trying to provide midwifery schools um, and support and so our role working with MSF when it's a very acute situation is still a lot of capacity building um, and I don't understand how it's going to get better because at the moment the situation in South Sudan remains very fragile it remains it remains very unstable which means that there are still there are no schools I've worked in three areas of South Sudan in the last six months and every time I ask where are the schools well the teachers don't get paid because the Ministry of Education doesn't pay them so they move so the movement of people and the displacement of people out of South Sudan means a lot of people have moved obviously into Kenya into Ethiopia into Sudan and into North Uganda so we have a massive depletion um, of, of skilled attendants to look after the women um, and going forward, that's not going to get better in the next 10, 15 years. We need to educate the next generation. There is a lack of comprehensive maternity care. So even if we have these small clinics where we're doing ANC, starting, starting to think about family planning, providing um, first contact for survivors of sexual and gender-based violence, actually the amount of operating theatres that can also provide blood transfusion is extremely few and far between. We're talking hundreds and hundreds of miles. Um, it's okay if you have MSF because we will always have an operating theatre or we will work in partnership with another NGO such, such as International Medical Corps um, that will have uh, an operating theatre that will be able to refer women to safely and will have transport. But actually, people who live very rurally, um, if you look on a map uh, and, and say, well, where's the nearest operating theatre for a woman who, you know, almost you can close your eyes and, and point anywhere on a map and it will be hundreds of miles mostly. And that's pretty difficult to comprehend that if there's a, com if there's a complication, what happens? And so what happens is, is that South Sudan has the highest maternal mortality rate in the world. Um, I don't even think that all of these stats are easy to um, gather together. I'm not, I'm not sure where I think a lot of them are estimated because I'm telling you now that I know that when we have deaths, we report them and we do full investigations, but I'm not sure about what happens when it's so rural and women are in the bush that how do these deaths get reported? So the stats that we're working with at the moment um, are that around, we th they think, World Health Organization thinks around 789 women per 100,000 will die of pregnancy or um, childbearing uh, reasons. If we link that to the UK, the UK is nine, and that's nine too many. So that's nine per 100,000, and in South Sudan, it's 
789. It's a, it's, you can't really understand that number, can you? Because I can't. It's pretty terrifying. And it must be pretty terrifying to be pregnant. And I think that's often some of the things that women will say to us. You know, I'm frightened. And is it all going to be okay? And this leads on to the correlation between conflict and sexual and gender-based violence, SGBV. And this is what we see a lot of. And we're seeing a lot, and that worries me that they're the women who are coming, I would probably triple it of what is actually happening in the community. Do we know that when there's conflict, when there's a man-made disaster, when there's a natural disaster, um, that the rates of sexual and gender-based violence increase? And I would definitely say that that is um, something that I agree with, and that is something that MSF is seeing a lot of. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in the presentation. Trauma experienced by staff. Now, what does that mean? Now, I personally think that that, that, that means about displacement, about leaving all of your uh, leaving your life behind and moving because um, because armed forces have come to move you. Um, Sometimes moving your family to uh, a refugee camp in a different country, and then maybe you're the only person that is able to work. Um, and so you come back into your own country, back into South Sudan, um, and you send your money to, to your family in the refugee camp. I worked with staff in Bentiu last year who hadn't seen their children for a year because they were in Kaguma, which is a refugee camp in northern Kenya. It's, it's just so difficult to, to understand how they must feel. And, you know, there's me trying to be like, you know, you really need to be listening in with a pinard every 15 minutes and documenting it on the partogram. And I'm sure they just must think, really, Claire, I've got other things to be thinking about, even though they, would, they did do it and they did do it well. Um, but I think that's another issue to bring into it, that the trauma that people bring and their own experiences um, of, of being in, in a conflict zone. And um, really interestingly, uh, MSF sent a psychologist for staff in Malakal um, last month, and I thought that was a really excellent thing for them to do so they could have one-on-one -on -one sessions, and confidential sessions where they could just talk about how they're feeling, not about work necessarily, um, but something for them because they had experience so much trauma that's so difficult to comprehend. Uh, tribal and political boundaries and their effects on healthcare provision. Okay, so um, I'll tell you, this is, a, uh, um, this is a presentation full of stories, I'm sorry. Um, but as someone said to me this week, that Claire, midwives are different to doctors. They do love to tell a story and they sometimes do that in their documentation too. So boundaries and their effects on healthcare provision. What do I mean? Okay, so quickly, because I think I've already been talking for 20 minutes, I'm on slide three. Um, I had a lady back last year who uh, delivered baby number, I think it was baby number six. So actually she had a, she had a massive postpartum hemorrhage. Um, I didn't have any tranexamic acid, so maybe this is something that MSF will be bringing hopefully into their policies. Um, uh, she was stable, which, uh, in my opinion, um, I needed to transfer her. Uh, I wanted to give her a blood transfusion. She, so she was stable, but not that stable. Um, trying to find a, a man to donate blood was difficult. Her husband was um, in, in an armed group, um, so wasn't around, but her brother-in-law was. Uh, she was of the New Air tribe, and trying to find somebody who could give blood uh, that could that could go to the comprehensive centre, which was also in the United Nations, uh, another POC, so Protection of Civilians camp. So if you think of it as um, a refugee camp, but for internally displaced people, um, the problem with these camps is a bit like, um, they're, how do I put it? They have, um, they're very political. How do I, that's how I put it, to be diplomatic. They're very political. So if you are not of a tribe, um, it's almost like gang warfare, but it's tribal, um, then you can't go. So it turned out that this gentleman, her brother-in-law, was not of the right political view of 
the right tribe. And so he he couldn't come. And so we had to try and find another man. So we had to try and almost find a friend that would donate blood for his sister-in-law. And these are very, very difficult things. And they take a long time. Um, and all the time I'm inside of a Land Cruiser with the lady on a stretcher on the back with the newborn baby trying to find a blood donor. Um, and this is all because of the tribal warfare that is happening and the political views. And that has a massive effect, more than you would realise, on actually healthcare provision. Water and sanitation. Um, unable to build latrines on rented land. So what does that mean? So that means that with the displacement that I keep talking about, so let's try and put it in UK terms. If there is, um, there's big warfare around Bristol, all of the people from Bristol have moved to Birmingham. All the people in Birmingham had already left to Edinburgh. Okay, So all the people in Bristol, they're now in Birmingham and they're effectively squatting in the houses of people um, from Birmingham. Okay, But they cannot go into the back garden and build a latrine. That is completely against um, their culture. Yes, they can go and live in their houses, but they could never build latrines. This is what people told me, that they, that was a complete no-no. So obviously we had issues um, with sanitation and um, and yeah uh, and the illnesses that that uh, come from that. So these are all things related to conflict that you don't necessarily think about when you go in as the midwife. Okay, um, some photos for you. So this is the maternity in Bentu Town, which is in the north of South Sudan. Um, I was there last year and we had, there were, what, there were five of us all together. That was including um, Jani, who was our translator. Um, they're two hours ahead and they will be at work right now, but I'm hoping that they will see this later. And so my role and our role as MSF is to support and educate. Um, and we provide basic maternity care in Bentiu Town. And in Bentiu POC, the Protection of Civilians, big compound run by the UN, the MSF has a comprehensive centre there. So we have a scanner, we have a anaesthetist, an anaesthetist, we have surgeons, and we can do a caesarean section. But actually here in Bentiu Town, which was about a 40 minute drive away, we slept here, um, so we were here 24-7, but we were not able to transfer women um, basically in the dark, okay? And as you can see here, there were, um, this is our waiting area and this is where women came in. So it's about trying to provide privacy. And um, I think the way I described it to someone was basically it's the Spice Girls. And, some, and one of my colleagues said, I'm not sure how professional that sounds, Claire. And I said, it's really professional because it's all about women. And back in the 90s, when all of this feminism was very, it really felt like it was, it was feeding into reality. And so um, that was my kind of hashtag, but it was Spice Girls and reality. Um, we had uh, female uh, guards. And there were four staff, South Sudanese staff and myself. And if you were a man, you were not allowed in. Um, and I really liked that. I really, really liked that. And it was quite difficult when we had women who, um, it was clear that they had sexually transmitted infections and trying to find um, somewhere that we could speak to them um, in private with their husband. That was more of a challenge trying to figure out what where was the most appropriate place. So we took them into outpatients into a special, more of a private room. Um, and why this really matters. Okay, so for me, not only is it all about maternity and women being together, it's also about having private spaces to to provide good quality confidential care 
for women especially who have been raped or had sexual assault and that is what we're seeing a lot of in South Sudan women who have been abducted by gunpoint I'm saying it but I can't really I, I just find it so difficult to, this is what's happening this is what is happening and they have no one to tell because they feel their community will shun them and their husband will divorce them and that means that they will die and that is what women believe and that is how communities perceive people um, so there's a lot of work for us to do regarding engaging the community um, working with both men and women um, and and providing a service that women can really access and that's why I'm, I'm really happy with what happened in Mentiu and the lo logistics um, that it that it meant it basically gave the logisticians a big headache to create this this female only space um, but the women liked it and the women queued up every day I mean 40 women a day would come uh, let alone the women coming in with their with their small babies with chest infections let alone the women coming in uh, bleeding needing post-abortion care as well as the women in labor so it was a very busy busy clinic and yes um, I know you can see the delivery table uh, delivery bed um, but we did have a mattress and um, we did try and support women to use the mattress they could be a bit more upright but you know people always say as soon as the midwife arrives oh you've got a bed and I think oh god if you just bought us a couple of mattresses that's actually all we really need Okay, so um, challenges for women and babies on the move. And there is a lot of movement, sadly, in South Sudan. There is a lot, a lot of movement of women, pregnant women, women with new babies being pushed out um, of their homes by armed groups. So the challenge is finding safe, free, accessible maternity care. Um, very, very difficult. Uh, for women to access this without uh, international and uh, non-governmental organisations, okay? Because as I said, the Ministry of Health doesn't really exist in South Sudan. Nutrition and food insecurity. Yes, I know you've heard probably a lot about the famine that is happening. It is happening in South Sudan. I want you to be aware that that is happening and the World Food, the World Food Programme is doing an absolutely wonderful job with airdrops and trying to make sure that, women, that everybody is fed. Why is there insecurity? Okay, so I'm going back to the movement. If you plant your crops and then you're pushed out of your community and you're forced to be on the move, you can't go back and water those crops. You can't go back and cultivate those crops. They've gone. They've been burned. People burn. These, these armed groups are burning everything, okay? So... People don't have the food security that they would normally have. So this time it's not about climate. It's not, it's not that there isn't rain. It's the fact that people are on the move and they cannot, um, they don't have any crops. They don't have any food to cultivate. Nutrition is a big issue. I've never seen more nutritional issues than both times I've worked in South Sudan. Women, um, as you can see here, this is a muak, so a um, mid to upper arm circumference that we use. And um, the, the parameters are obviously lower for pregnant and lactating women. And so this meant that a lot of women were on um, food supplements that we could provide um, for them. And obviously that, that has a knock-on effect to the pregnancy and to the baby as well. So seeing a lot of low birth weight babies. Other challenges for women and babies on the move regarding documentation and follow-up. And a lot of people will say to me, when you go overseas, you haven't got to do as much writing. No, you do have to do just as much writing. Um, it's just as vitally important, and the follow-up as well. Um, it may not just be reams of it, but the, the documentation is still there, and I think that's important to, to reinforce. Um, and if a partogram isn't filled in, then that is, um, that's just as serious as it is here in the UK. Um, so women who, who don't have their documentation because they've had to flee their home, um, women who don't know when their baby's immunizations were last given um, because actually they, they don't have the piece of paper because actually when they left their home, that wasn't really on the priority list. General postnatal care, of, and I mean that regarding small 
babies. So knowing if babies have put on a good amount of weight um, and following that up. So uh, that for me was always a really, really big hurdle of knowing that I'm sending him a small baby. Am I going to see you again? Is it possible that we can follow you up in one of our mobile clinics? Um, and, and the amount of work that is as well to try and chase his own up because there is no phone signal. And I think a lot of people think, oh, but, if, you know, Claire, you know, Africa, people have got phones. They may have phones, but they also might not have any charge on it because there's no electricity, okay? They may not have any credit on it. So it's not something in, in a post and current conflict that we can rely on. Caring for women with fistulas. Again, I remember in, in DRC when I said, right, let's get a, a, a fistula surgeon here. We can really make a big difference to all these women's lives, trying to take their village and their name and then trying to follow them up three months later so that we can make sure that we had the right numbers for our surgeon was so difficult because actually people are on the move. People, are, people aren't where they said they were. They don't have phones. They don't have addresses. So, how, so caring for these women um, with fistulas is, is also a really big challenge. Contraception. Um, so giving depot, um, it's, it's great. But it's a short term contraception, isn't it? It's three months. So actually, how do I follow you up? Women who um, are interested in having a contraceptive implant, they get concerned that if actually the, the side effects are too much for them, who's going to take it out if something happens? And who's going to take it out in five years? Because who, who, who does that for me, Claire? So these questions are, are pertinent and we do need to think about this. Um, and how do we provide contraception um, and training people enough so that they, they feel confident in, in removing implants as well as putting them in? And going back to um, the challenges of women and babies on the move and the correlation that they, they experience with um, sexual and gender-based violence. This isn't just happening um, by... Uh, by, by armed actors. I met many women last month who were experiencing intimate partner violence and trying to provide them with some form of protection and offering them to speak to humanitarian workers that may be able to do some mediation in their community um, to, to try and help them have a less violent life. Um, and it's so much more than than being a midwife, and I think that's I, I did so much more sexual and gender based violence and, and family planning, uh, counselling and, and education than I did of actually delivering babies this time. And I think that's really showing us the need um, of of mid of midwives um, in a current conflict zone. And as you're probably aware, the challenges regarding access and transport. So access, talking about security, traveling at night, not, not possible, not safe. Transport, you know, there are no, there's no buses, there are no cars. And, and if people, if women are traveling um, with other women, you know, they, they are targets, they are more vulnerable. Um, in certain cultures in South Sudan, um, cattle are seen as, as a higher status than women. That's only in some cultures, but I think that's important to, to bring into the context, okay? And going back to the tribal and political barriers again about accessing comprehensive care, if it's in compound, is that then uh, safe for people to access or not? And I want to share um, Nagai's story um, because she was very special and she is very special. She, she gave birth in September and she was 15 years old and I was called around 3.30 in the morning, I think, on the radio. And um, I remember we had a, we have a solar lamp and there were flies everywhere and it was a hot night. And... Uh, Rhoda, one of the midwives, had called me and she said, um, Claire, this, this is what we've got. And she pointed to her vagina 
and there were just two testicles hanging out of this vagina of the guys and I just I think I took a deep breath and then probably rubbed my face and <laughs> was okay this is going to be fine and we found the fetal heart rate and we did all of our observations and she was actually she was doing fantastic and she did acrobatics for us and um really was you know remained upright and was pushing and um yeah she she was a real inspiration she just she just was fantastic and i remember um saying she really doesn't look very old and rhoda said no it's the first baby it's the first baby she's 15 and i think that's the other issue to bring into this so within this context in south sudan you know women do get married um very young and um, that can also bring a lot of potential challenges regarding birth as we all know so i won't go too much into this um, as i've been talking a lot basically she has a beautiful um delivery while i'm still um thinking about every maneuver to to uh, overcome every problem that could possibly go wrong with this vaginal breech birth and obviously this baby comes out delivers itself and it's really quite emotional and it's a very hot day so she, she delivers around 6 six thirty in the morning and she's going to have some tea and bread and the clinic's very very busy so by the time it gets to around 4 4 30 i said the guy are you going home and she says yeah, yeah i'm just i'm just packing up and because of all the flies and the insects and the heat she, she put a little um piece of cloth over her baby's face to, to protect the baby from being um, bitten by mosquitoes and flies and all of that which is quite normal and so i just or can I just have a bit look at the baby and look at the baby boy and um this baby was sweating profusely and and um was very tachypneic and had a had a fever of 38.8 and um, I said oh, you know guy, your baby's not well and then you know, so we cannulated the baby gave the baby antibiotics and I said I, I want to transfer your baby to the comprehensive maternity unit again 40 minute drive within the boundaries of the united nations in the protection of civilian site for the idps so there's a lot of abbreviations and um and she said okay but if you say that's the best thing for my baby she was you know very um she was articulate and she understood the importance so um i didn't take her my colleague took her down in the in the jeep and we handed over on the radio and i was quite happy that that you know this baby had a good weight it was 3.2 kilos and had we picked it up so you know it's good that she didn't go home anyway so she told her sister but her sister refused to go to the uh, comprehensive center and around 7 30 i was sat at my computer um in the in the compound and, and rhoda knocked on the door and she said claire um the guy's father's here i said oh right well i'm i'm not sure it's probably too late now i, I don't we won't get get him down the hospital now he'll have to go in the morning and he and she just said no claire he, he's come to collect her body and that's what he said so when and i couldn't quite understand i thought maybe i misheard and the guy's father had come to request the body and he didn't believe me when i said that the baby was unwell and he just said it's okay i would like the body of my daughter please because I know she came to the clinic and she hasn't come home. So that to me must mean she died. So please can I have the body of my daughter? And that isn't a story from 25 years ago. That is a story from September 2016. This is not normal that people should be believing that that is okay. And that that is, well, she didn't come home, so she must have died. I was, and this doesn't happen once. This happened three times where people got transferred there was no communication or maybe her sister didn't get home in time to meet the father and and people coming to um to collect the bodies of of pregnant women and i think that that's very telling in south sudan and that shows us how much we have to still do okay so um, going forward, um, I'm quite passionate about how how do strategies that are 
being made in boardrooms um, with people dressed in wonderful clothes, eating great food. How is that realised on the front line? How are we going to realise and actually make these sustainable development goals? How do we achieve those? More than 225 million women have unmet needs of contraception in the world right now. You know, uh, it, there is a lot to do. Um, I don't necessarily have the answers for you, but I think it's really important about how that strategy gets realised on the front line, how that money, how does that get there? Yesterday I was with friends who said, oh, I, I donated some money to the famine in South Sudan. Was that the right thing to do, Claire? Is that really happening? Yes, it's really happening. Yes, if you give your money to the World Food Programme, they are doing a great job. That's my opinion. That's from, from what my eyes have seen. Um, and following on from really what um, Joy Kemp was saying about collaboration um, with, with your, your host, and, and I think the MSF catchphrase, as it were, um, is that normally we like to say we are your guest and we work in collaboration with the Ministry of Health. And that's definitely what we did clearly in the DRC and how we work still in the DRC and that's how we work in Haiti as well. It just there is no Ministry of Health, as I've said, um, to to work with in South Sudan. And the communication is the key. And that good collaboration will mean that we actually achieve more in partnership. I'm very um, passionate about involving men um, and educating men. And actually, when you start the dialogue involving men, they just, they want to help their women. <laughs> they just... You know, these are things that, that people don't know about. I was doing a session um, two weeks ago in South Sudan, in, in Yambio in the South, talking about uh, contraception. And we covered everything. So we started talking about female condoms. And a man turned around to me and said, so if she's supposed to leave the female condom in for a couple of hours, she'll have to take it out when she needs to go um, and pass urine. And so we did a small session on female genitalia and juice and do some um uh, did some drawings <laughs> of vaginas and that really amused them um i'm sure they would have been blushing if they hadn't had such black skin um so involving men is is definitely a big thing that we need to do more of and education around um education around contraception and fgc so sometimes people will write fgm female genital mutilation i don't particularly like using um that word uh, mutilation i like that's just a pers personal thing in my practice i prefer to use the word cutting um and like i say using every opportunity to start a dialogue and whether that's with women or men young or older i think that's um that's the key and as is making the strategy that is being made in boardrooms how do we realize this on the front line it needs to be down to grassroots, and that's how we're really going to have um, all of these wonderful ideas that we have um, about realising them um, and also having the, the cash behind it because actually we all know that these, these are long, these aren't just a, a short-term intervention. We want to be there for the long term for, for women and babies. Um, I've talked a lot. Sorry. Thank you if you're still listening. Um, I... I think there's lots of questions. I haven't read them. Pandora? Yes, Claire, thank you for that presentation. There is one question from Lindsay saying, asking you, did you have UK contraception, abortion, rape, and survivor support before you went out with MSF? We have about five minutes left. If you could just speak to that and the issue of support for the healthcare clinicians who are working okay, in conflict Okay, so um, did I have, I can see it now, yeah, the contraception, abortion, uh, rape, survivor support before you went out with MSF. Okay, so MSF sent me on a course after three months, um, so a full week of um, basically understanding SGBV and how to uh, implement a service and also how to train the trainer, as it were. So it would mean that I could then leave um, my team of midwives in uh, Democratic Republic of Congo at that point, this was 2015, um, with the skills uh, to be the focal points, um, which is what we really wanted. But no, and I think it's a very, it's a very 
good question because actually my skills and knowledge around abortion, post-abortion care, termination of pregnancy, uh, being able to put in implants and intrauterine devices was very limited. And so MSF has, has trained me um, in that. And I'm very lucky that I have those skills now. But in those first uh, couple of months, no, definitely. Yeah, they, the, the Congolese midwives were holding my hand and, uh, and teaching me a lot, yeah. And the second question was Pandora. Speaking quickly, very quickly, to systems of support for the healthcare workers such as yourself on exit and re-entry um, as you're now re-entering. I think when you work with a big organization like Medicine Sans Frontier, you're very lucky. Um, <clears throat> on the front of the fridge in South Sudan where I've just been was the psychosocial support, which is a 24-hour free line that we can call to uh, Europe where we have a psychologist at the end of the phone 24 seven. Um, often for, for me, that's knowing that it's there, that's enough. Um, and that's in all the projects that I've been in. Uh, everyone is very much, if you need a phone, you call, you just go and speak to, to your manager. You don't need to ask what it's for because people will probably be like, she just wants to, to give someone a call. Uh, when you come back uh, yesterday, I spoke to the psychologist in Barcelona uh, maybe an hour and a half on the phone of just decompressing. I think that's the word that people use. Um, and that is always, I, I always say I don't need it. And then after 90 minutes, I go, oh, I feel a lot better. Thanks for that. So that's great for me. But I think we can do more for, for our staff um, in country. And that's why I said I think it was really great that MSF Spain sent out their psychologist. Um, she was out there for two weeks doing one-on-ones group sessions with different uh, groups uh yeah i think that was i was i was really impressed with msf for doing that i was really happy and, and i think they were aware that that was needed through to all of the displacement and trauma that's going on at the moment okay. well, we thank you all for joining us Time has rapidly run, and that wraps up this particular session. I know that there are some questions pending. The following session that is next up will also deal with midwifery um, in disaster settings, so I encourage some of you to stay logged on with that, and we can begin the dialogue to carry forward with some of these Pandora, questions. Pandora, could I just, um, I could maybe type the answer to some of the questions while... Um while you're preparing the next session, would that be okay? That would be lovely. Thanks, Thank Laura. you very much, Claire.